Welcome to Chapter 2, which covers the inner workings of a law office. I'm going to try to keep each one of these WIMBA broadcasts to about 30 minutes, so we won't be able to cover the complete Chapter 2. You'll be able to hear that lecture on a subsequent um, WIMBA lecture. So let's go forward. Um, as we discussed in class, you'll find the blanks um, or you'll find your study guide has blanks, and of course, um, where you see the um, underlined word, those are the words that go into the blanks. Um, so um, if you, for example, may want to listen to the lecture one time without looking at um, the uh, study guide, and then the second time you might go back, listen to it, perhaps uh, speeding through certain sections that you um, feel like you mastered to just write in the blanks. Uh, of course, the methodology that you use is completely your own, but that's just one way of approaching this. So let's start thinking about what we're going to cover in Chapter 2. A little study tip that I have found very helpful for me is when I start a chapter, I um, read what the title is, and many times it will be at the very beginning of the chapter, a set of expectations. What am I going to be learning? And so I may actually take a few notes and write down some key ideas that I expect to, to master or at least develop a greater understanding about. And as I'm reading for it, I'm looking for those concepts. It's so important when you're uh, researching or uh, learning new material to keep in mind the minutia of what you're learning, but also the big picture. How does what I'm learning right now affect my complete understanding of this subject? And how does what I'm learning right now interact and relate to something else I've learned previously or something that I expect to be learning in the future? Uh, those are higher order reasoning skills, and not only are they important for ultimate mastery, they make the learning process quite a bit more entertaining, and they also help you retain the knowledge a lot longer. So there's a lot of reasons to think as you're reading beyond just incorporating the, the knowledge that's right before you. So let's get started. Let's talk about what we're going to accomplish in this chapter. We're going to talk about what life is like in a law firm in the United States, particularly in Texas. But, of course, our textbook is a national textbook, so we'll be focusing especially on Texas. But um, obviously I will be uh, drawing our attention to uh, uh, ways in which Texas law firms might be a little bit more, uh, might be different in certain respects or might have a certain characteristic more prominently than other parts of the country might. Um, and so we're going to be talking about how that uh, situation or that, that law office environment is, how it might compare to working for a corporation's law department, how it might relate to working for a large corporation um, that doesn't have anything to do with the law. And so we'll be trying to put those those points um, in, in relationship to one another. Some of you in this class probably haven't worked in a large corporation or a large a place of employment or perhaps an office environment before. And so many things I'm going to be saying are going to relate to pretty much any kind of office environment. Many of you will have worked in um, office environments, an uh, eight to five type job where you are sitting at a desk or interacting with a computer a lot. Um, and so uh, what I would recommend that you do is look at differences. How is the law firm or the legal department in a corporation different from what you've experienced in a white-collar environment. First thing to keep in mind is that most paralegals work in private law firms. That is by far the overwhelming um, number. I've seen the statistics anywhere from two-thirds of all paralegals work in law firms to 75%. Um, even more than that uh, number, though, you find that new paralegals almost always start in law firms. Um, maybe after you've been practicing five or ten years, you may transition to a corporation or some other employment possibility. But um, for your first job, it's very, very likely that you will start in a law firm. Even though you somehow or another end up not starting your current law firm, it's still very, very important that you know how law firms work because you will almost certainly be dealing with law firms even if you aren't actually working for one. And we'll talk about what that means later on. So what we're going to try to do in this chapter is giving you an, an idea about what this environment is like, um, what to expect, how to maneuver through that environment successfully so that you'll have a rewarding career, that you will have reasonable expectations, and that when things maybe aren't going as you had expected, you'll have a point of reference to say, hey, you know, is my expectations out of line or perhaps is something happening here that ought not be happening? So let's, that's kind of the big picture stuff. Let's focus now on 
um, kind of two categories of law firms, and I'm going to call them large firms and small firms because the most obvious distinction between a large firm and a small firm is, guess what, the size. Typically, firms are described in terms of the number of attorneys that work for the law firm. Now, the number of attorneys and the number of paralegals don't always mesh up. Um, most law firms have fewer paralegals than they have attorneys, although that's not always true. Um, and there are certain practices that tend to be more paralegal heavy or paralegal like than another. So you might be in one practice where there might be uh, five attorneys and only one or two paralegals. There might be another uh, department that has five attorneys and seven paralegals. Having said that, as a general rule, you could probably say that there's going to be um, a third or a half as many paralegals as there are attorneys. Uh, but again, when people are thinking about the size of the law firm, they're typically focusing on the number of attorneys. Um, now, obviously, the, the big distinction between a large firm and a small firm is the number of attorneys that work there, maybe the number of total employees that work there. But that probably isn't the most interesting difference. And we'll go through and talk about the cultural differences, the expectational differences. And many of these differences are not necessarily that intuitive. You wouldn't necessarily know just by common sense that a large law firm is going to work this way versus a small law firm. Um, and as soon as, of course, we talk in generalities, it's always dangerous because um, there are large law firms that don't fit the mold that I'm going to talk about, and there are definitely small law firms that don't fit the mold that I'm going to talk about. So you always want to be tweaking and adjusting your expectations based upon what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're picking up in a particular environment. It's also a good idea to talk to other professionals in this area, attorneys, paralegals, um, support staff in these types of environments, um, because my experiences aren't going to be the, the same that other people might have. Um, you might find that um, if you talk to, to 10 or 15 different legal professionals, you're going, to, you're going to hear 10 or 15 different perspectives on these issues. And it's probably not that anybody is intentionally misleading you, but we all come with a certain set of expectations and a priori assumptions about a work environment. So ask a lot, talk a lot, listen a lot, figure out kind of what an environment is like, and be prepared to adjust your expectations based upon what you see. Okay. Um, the, the particular topics we're going to focus on are things like, what is the nature of the employment relationship in a law firm? How are documents and, and data uh, kept in a law firm? Uh, Timekeeping and billing, of course, hand in hand because the product that a law firm produces isn't a widget. Um, it's not a car. It's not a light bulb. It's time. Most legal professionals um, bill their time based upon the number of hours they spend on a given project. That's going to be attorneys and it's also going to be paralegals. There are other billing arrangements, and we'll talk about those um, as the course progresses, but the, the standard, the usual, the kind of expected means of compensation is going to be the number of hours that you work on a given product. So that is your equivalent of a widget. An hour of your time is kind of the, the moral equivalent, or the financial equivalent at least, of uh, somebody who assembles, say, 10 widgets an hour. So they've produced 10 widgets, you've produced 60 minutes of work for that particular client. And we'll talk about the process by which a, um, a law firm bills uh, that, that client. And then we'll talk a little bit about financial procedures. As I said before, we'll talk about the cultural differences, uh, both within the large law firm and the small law firm, as well as between law firms generally and other places of employment, corporations, government employment, nonprofit employment. And then we'll talk a little bit about politics. When I say politics in this context, I'm not talking about Republican, Democratic type politics. I'm talking about office politics. Uh, certainly law firms are uh, pretty famous for being very politically involved. You don't have to look around to see that a large portion of our elected officials are lawyers. Uh, President Obama is an attorney. Uh, President Clinton was an attorney. Um, uh, our Senator um, John Cornyn was um, a, uh, 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 an attorney before he... Um, uh, you know, became a Supreme Court justice and then ultimately became a senator. Um, uh, our, our other senator, Ted Cruz, was also it, is also an attorney. Um, so that's a very common uh, path to, to follow. Um, currently, the re a lead Republican candidate for the governorship of Texas 
uh, Mr. Greg Abbott is an attorney. He's the attorney general for the state of Texas right now. So it's very common. And in most cases, these attorneys um, developed their uh, political ambitions and their networking through the law firm environment. That's not true in every case. I would say that it's not so much true for um, uh, President Obama, but it certainly be true for Senator Cruz and Senator Cornyn and um, uh, Senator, I mean, uh, Attorney General Abbott. So we'll we'll go forward. We'll talk about that. Now, having said that, there's lots of law firms. But I think most law firms aren't that political. Um, but it's it's a helpful thing to keep in mind that politics have some interaction in a law firm environment. Now, there are law firms that are politically conservative and there are law firms that are politically liberal. It's not that there's a particular political perspective in the practice of law. Okay, we're going to talk about some legal organizational structures that we find in law firms. The first is a sole proprietorship. Now, this method of um, legal organization for a law firm isn't unique to law firms. Um, it is kind of the, the default position for any business person. Let's say I decide to establish a taco stand, and my business model is I'm going to sell tacos. And I'm not going to incorporate, and I'm not going to have a partner, and I'm not going to establish a limited liability company. I've decided to just kind of start selling tacos. Um, that would be a sole proprietorship. So you can be a sole proprietorship doing any kind of lawful business, from selling tacos to making widgets to practicing law. And so this is a, a model that is uh, uh, obviously been around kind of since Adam and Eve, or <laughs> maybe not Adam and Eve, but, but as soon as there was there was commercial activity. Um, so let's look at uh, the, the characteristics that we find with sole proprietorship. Well, the first one that is important to note is we have the word sole. There's only one. As soon as more than one person is involved in owning the business, you no longer have a sole proprietorship. Um, then you'd fit into the partnership category, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But um, for, the, for the point of view of the sole proprietorship, um, you can have lots of employees in a sole proprietorship, but you can only have one owner. Let's pause for a moment and think about the distinction between an owner and a, an employee. An owner gets to keep the profits of the business. An employee typically receives wages. The employee is going to be paid whether the business makes money or doesn't make money. Um, but the employee is not going to be guaranteed a percentage of the return that the business has. So it's a different model. It's not that it's necessarily better to be the owner versus the employee. If your business is very successful, obviously it would be. But if you're struggling, um, it's not unusual to find that the employees in a business actually take home more money than that owner when the owner isn't when the um, business isn't making a lot of profit. So sole proprietorship, only one owner. That's the first concept and the most important. That's where the the name sole proprietorship comes from. So that single owner gets to keep all the profits, which is good news. But if he has losses or he has liabilities, he is personally responsible for those. Imagine for a second that I am running my taco stand, and on Monday I uh, win the lottery, and I am awarded, we'll say, $10 million. Well, of course, I'm thrilled. I decide, though, to keep my taco stand going for a little while longer, and Sally comes and buys a taco from my taco stand. Maybe she saw in the news that I had won the lottery. Anyway, on her way out, she slips and falls on the stoop. Maybe it's legitimate. Maybe it's, uh, uh, it's a stage fall, but whatever, she sues me for it. And the jury buys her story, and the jury says, you know what, given the severity of Susie's injuries, or Sally, Sally's injuries, um, you're going to have to pay Sally a million dollars. Well, the day before I won my $10 million dollar uh, lottery uh, winnings, I only had $10,000 in the bank. So if Sally had um, tripped and I had never won the lottery, then even if she got a million dollar judgment against me, the only thing she'd be able to get is what I have. You can't get blood out of a turnip. If I don't have a million dollars, Sally's not going to be very successful at getting a million dollars from me unless, of course, I had some kind of insurance. So let's assume I don't have any insurance. But now that I have $10 million sitting in my bank account, of course she can get that million dollars. At least she can try to, and, and she, she can have a judgment against me, and it's quite possible I will be required to pay it. Now that $10 million that um, I happen to have in my bank account has no connection whatsoever with my taco stand. 
Um, I've been buying a lottery ticket every one every week for the last 10 years, let's assume, before I had the taco stand when I was in a completely different industry. So there's no connection whatsoever. But because I happen to have the $10 million and I happen to have the taco stand, um, Sally can take my personal assets as well as any assets associated with the taco stand. This is what's called unlimited personal liability. And this is a characteristic of sole proprietorship. You can see how it's not a very attractive characteristic for that sole proprietor. Now, of course, Sally or Susie, whatever her name is, is delighted that I am personally liable because she would have been up a creek if all she would have been able to successfully sue me for was the $10,000 that my business had in terms of assets, inventory, and bank account. Um, that would, let's assume her injuries were, were significant. Maybe she's paralyzed as a result of the accident. That's not going to go too far to giving her the medical treatment that she needs and the um, other um, issues that she's going to have to address over the course of her lifetime. Um, so she's delighted with this unlimited personal liability, but I am the one, I, the owner, get to decide how I uh, set up my business. And so it, it sort of makes sense during the early days of a business to try a sole proprietorship. After all, um, with a sole proprietorship, uh, you don't have to file any paperwork. You have to do very, very little. Now, there are certain things you have to do in every start, any kind of business. For example, you're going to have to get a sales tax permit, um, things like that. But there's nothing you have to do for the sole proprietorship aspect of the business. Um, it's the default position. It's what you have when you haven't done anything else. And you can imagine that if you are, say, a small business owner and you're not even sure if this is going to work out, the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of money talking to a bunch of boring attorneys. Um, now, of course, an attorney is in a bit different situation. He or she can perform these services for himself or herself. But you can see if you are running a business, if I'm a taco stand owner and I don't have any legal expertise, um, and I'm starting out, um, and, and you know, I'm maybe maybe clearing a few hundred dollars a month. The last thing I want to do is spend that very small profit on an attorney. So that's why sole proprietorships are uh, popular at the very beginning of the business. But as my uh, taco stand begins to prosper, I begin to get money, then I start thinking, hmm, maybe it might make sense, since this seems like it's going to succeed, to invest a little bit of money. And that might be the time that I go ahead and talk to an attorney. Another time that it might make sense for a sole proprietorship to go talk to an, uh, an attorney about this is when you have a sole proprietor who's going into a business and he, already, he or she already has a lot of assets. Perhaps he or she's inherited money or been successful um, in a previous stage in his or her life. And um, I'm going to pause this for a second. I flipped. I was, I was on Thank <laughs> you. 